Coming up next, the last musical wheel and testament of an all-time legend. Taken from the planet at the age of 27. Today's song is nearly as haunting as his death. It's a sinister and mystical epic about a spree killer that has some incredible insight into the artist that created it and the human psyche. One of the most haunting songs in the history of recorded music. We break down this song and this legendary band coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Now if music burns deep, deep within your soul, you should subscribe right now and make sure to click the bell when you do that to get our daily content. We also have a Patreon, you'll wanna check that out. There you're gonna find a whole other catalog of exclusive content. You can also become an honorary producer and help us to curate this music history. So it's time for another edition of our show, number one in our hearts. We haven't done one of these for a while. This is where we honor songs that uh, were so unbelievably great. They absolutely should have been number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. But for whatever reason, be it uh, radio play, lack of marketing, label support, or just sheer stupidity, came up short. Just to give you an idea of what uh, this is about, previous episodes we've covered, uh, uh, let's see, Under Pressure by Queen and David Bowie. Pressure. Free Fallen by Tom Petty and also Dream On by Aerosmith. So today we're gonna go all in on Jim Morrison and the Doors haunting last right, Riders on the Storm. Riders on the Storm. I've been waiting for this one for a long time. In late 1970, the Doors began work on their sixth studio album, LA Woman. It was a chaotic season for the band. Fallout from the Miami indecency uh, incident still weighed heavy. Situation is a blot upon our community and those that are responsible for profiting as a result of depravity and immorality as occurred here. The scope of this trial goes way beyond rock and roll. It's really about the First Amendment. What we're testing down there is the uh, issue of artistic freedom of expression. Morrison had been fighting multiple legal battles. The doors were being blacklisted on the radio and concert bookings were even in decline. Jim, for his part, threw himself deeper into the grips of alcoholism, substance abuse, and a few other self-destructive behaviors. Early in the writing process, producer Paul Rothschild would uh, reach his breaking point with this band, and he decided to call it quits. He was unimpressed with the new material and was completely fed up with Morrison's antics. He said Jim was unhappy with his role as a national sex symbol, and uh, he did everything in his power to obliterate that. He gained enormous weight, he grew a beard. I quit because I'd grown tired of dragging the doors from one album to another, especially an unwilling Jim Morrison, and he had virtually dried up. Those were Paul Rothschild's words. Ray Manzarek uh, recalls, we were given Paul a preview and he was bored. We played the songs very badly. There was no chi, no energy, and Paul couldn't bring us back to life. And John Densmore, he remembers an exasperated Rothschild calling an early rendition of Riders on the Storm cocktail music. However, Rothschild claims he was talking about Lover Madly. Either way, he basically said, uh, this is the end. No pun intended. This is the end, my only So from there, the doors really on their own. But this turned out to be exactly you know, what they needed. Enlisting the help of an engineer, Bruce Botnick, actually, they took the reins and produced L.A. Woman by themselves. The bulk of post-Rothschild L.A. Woman was recorded in only a week's time, it was from December 1970 to January 1971. After the recording was finished, Morrison announced that he was moving to Paris. And Manzarek, Densmore, and Krieger uh, actually thought this was a good idea. Uh, Jim needed a hiatus from being a rock star. He needed to escape a toxic environment and uh, the turbulent events of recent years. So it was in March 1971 that Jim joined his girl, Pamela Corson, in Paris. The way that she told the story of their brief exile in Paris was idyllic. Uh, gone were the pressures that had led to decadence. 
Jim nearly stopped his drinking, actually. He took long walks through the city, and he wrote huge quantities of fresh and exciting poetry. He even shaved his beard, and he lost weight. Though the retreat to Paris did smooth out some of Morrison's rougher edges, he still had so many demons to face. Stardom and self-realization were ever at odds within him, and Jim was just a firebrand by nature anyway. Unsurprisingly, he continued to struggle with alcohol dependency. Uh, certainly there were flashes of lucidity, but Morrison would yet sink deeper into the drunken abyss. Whatever Jim had intended Paris to be, it came to an abrupt halt when he died on uh, July 3rd, 1971. His manager said Morrison died six days ago in Paris, either of a heart attack or pneumonia. Uh, the most popular narrative says that Pam woke up to find Jim dead in the bathtub. Heart failure was the official cause of death, but no autopsy was performed to confirm what exactly happened. He was only 27, joined the infamous 27 Club with Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, and later Kurt Cobain, to name a few. Jim was promptly buried nearby in the Père Lachaise uh, Cemetery, and news of his uh, demise wasn't released until days after the fact. Rumors and fantastic tales have, of course, repeatedly spawned from the scant details surrounding Jim's death. Uh, claims of heroin overdose, assassination plots, and fake deaths have all circulated for years, but in the end, no one can say for sure how and why Morrison died. In what may be the, the final word on the matter, Ray Manzarek said, we don't know what happened to Jim in Paris, and I don't think we're ever gonna know. There are rumors, stories about Jim Morrison not being dead, but I think they're just stories. In a poetic foreshadowing of his passing, the last song that Jim recorded was Riders on the Storm. We're out on love, Riders on the Storm. It also happens to be the final track on L.A. Woman. Maybe that was an omen. Take it for what you will, but it's about as fitting a piece of artistic closure for the life of the Lizard King as you could ask for or imagine for that matter. Its imagery is eerily atmospheric and it evokes in the mind passage through a haunted, otherworldly wasteland. It's love it. The origins of Riders comes from an old Stan Jones country western song called Ghost Riders in the Sky. Ghost Riders in the Sky. This musical folktale uh, chronicles a visionary cowboy who sees red eyed, steel hooved cattle racing across the sky pursued by the, the ghostly forms of damned cowboys. In his vision, he is uh, warned to change his ways, lest he be doomed to join them, forever chasing the devil's herd across endless skies. Now, Manzarek says that during one of the early rehearsal jams that fueled L.A. Woman, Robbie was playing uh, around with this song on his twang guitar. Riders on the storm. And Jim went, I got lyrics for that and he had Riders on the Storm. The eerie wordscape that Morrison created proved a perfect fit for Krieger and Manzarek's equally foreboding music. Take a long holiday. And though Jim penned comparatively few lyrics for this seven plus minute musical road trip, they were enough to establish a, just a vivid scene in the listener's imagination. Jim masterfully transformed the story of phantom wranglers into a story about a different sort of specter, a killer on the road. His brain is squirming like a toad. And his poetry mixed with the, the mystical music is truly one of those harrowing and, and tormenting songs in recorded music history. So let's break down the lyrics. Riders on the storm into this house were born. Into this house were born. Into this world were thrown like a dog without a bone, an actor out on loan. Actor out on loan. Riders on the storm. Riders on the storm. The chorus pays homage to the uh, philosophical teachings that Jim absorbed while he attended UCLA. Martin Heidegger, a German philosopher, asserted the idea of thrownness uh, that Jim uses here. The, the gist of the concept is that all of us are thrown into the world 
a world that we can't understand or make sense of. The result is that we are left to blindly cope with what seems to be a series of random circumstances. This idea really resonated with Morrison, and it's one of the underpinnings for writer's lyrics. The first verse referencing indiscriminate murder. Uh, it's uncomfortable to contemplate in the best case scenario, but it suitably highlights Morrison's morbid fascination with, with death and his chaotic elements. On one level, it's a window into Morrison's psyche, symbolizing the rogues and monsters with which he fought. There's a killer on the road, his brain is squirming like a toad. It's one of my favorite lyrics. There's a killer on the road, his brain is squirming. Take a long holiday, let your children play. If you give this man a ride, sweet family will die. Killer on the road. If you give this man a ride, sweet family will die. This verse likely spawns from Jim Morrison's experimental short film, Highway, an American pastoral, in which uh, Morrison plays a murderous hitchhiker. This in turn was drawn from the story of serial killer Billy Cook, who killed six people while hitchhiking uh, from Missouri to California in 1950. But the lyrics do take a more hopeful turn in the second verse. Girl, you gotta love your man. Take him by the hand. Make him understand. The world on you depends. Our life will never end. Gotta love your man. Gotta love your man. Reflecting on the, the meaning of the lyrics years later, Ray Manzarek said that Jim couldn't leave the song hanging solely on the grisly outcome of the first verse. The song was just too haunted and too beautiful, and almost as if he had a premonition, and certainly he knew at this point, seeing this vocal, uh, he knew he was going to Paris. He was singing his love to Pam and trying to wipe out in his mind and on the planet the killer on the road. Now, with the second verse, Jim turns the darkness of the first uh, on its head. The song becomes about redemption, really. So Manzarek said, girl, you gotta love your man is the last line. It's a hint. This is what he said. It's a hint. It's a foreshadowing. It's Jim's unconscious uh, telling us all and maybe telling him the last one. But your life will never end. Our life will never end. Gotta love your man. I love his vocal on this. Always loved his, his unassuming, uh, yeah, you know, when he says that. Yeah. It's awesome. Anyway, the ghostly flair of Riders is enhanced by two auditory flourishes. First, there's a whispered voice. If you listen closely, you can hear a whispering overdub that Jim added beneath his vocal. Riders on the storm. John Densmore recalls, I had this idea, which I suggested to Bruce, that Jim should go back in and do another vocal that was just whispered. It's really subliminal. Uh, unless you know it's there, you can't really hear it. The result of Jim's whispering, it's a very eerie echoing effect. You gotta check it out. Killer on the road, yeah. Manzarek said that this was the last time that he saw Jim. It was there in the recording studio when they were finishing up the album. This was the last time that Jim ever sang on planet Earth to his knowledge. Certainly it was the last time he ever sang with the doors. Just saying it makes hair stand up on my neck. The second flourish is uh, the sound effect that Botnik added to the song while he was mixing it. We all thought of the idea for the sound effects, Botnik remembered, but uh, Jim was the one who first said it out loud. Wouldn't it be cool to add rain and thunder? I used the Electra sound effects recordings and as we were mixing, I just pressed the button. Serendipity worked so that all the thunder came in at all the right places. It, it took you somewhere. It was like a mini movie in our heads. Really just cinema of the mind. Ray Manzarek agreed with the notion. He said it's, it's a cinematic song. The desert can make incredible thunderstorms. Way off in the distance, there's the glow of the lights of Los Angeles, but that person on the road is mad. Now to me, the entire painted picture is a, 
It's an incredible juxtaposition of light and darkness, uh, hope and despair. Listening to it uh, removes you from your surrounding. It drops you in the middle of the desert of your own soul. And there you just wander, searching for your purpose on a lonely highway, all the while knowing that the storm on the horizon is just inching closer. It just haunts me even thinking about it. I've listened to it so many times in complete darkness, right in the dead of night. It just transports me every time. You know what I mean. Unfortunately, The Doors only performed Riders on the Storm uh, live, I believe it was only twice. Both were a part of Jim Morrison's final two performances, which uh, was before the song had been completed. The first was at the Dallas Fairgrounds on December 11, 1970. Ladies and gentlemen, The Doors. <laughs> The second was during their disastrous final performance in New Orleans. That took place the following day, December 12, 1970. During what would become the close of the band's final show, Morrison stumbled around the stage and he rambled into the mic and he slumped in front of the microphone stand. Manzarek said he saw uh, Morrison's spirit leave his body. When Morrison returned to consciousness, uh, he smashed the microphone stand into the stage until it uh, completely shattered. And so the, the curtains were drawn on Morrison's last live performance. Now, allegedly, the New Orleans show was recorded from the mixing board, but the tapes have never resurfaced, uh, or never surfaced at all. And since Morrison died a half year later, we can only wonder how Riders on the Storm in all its mythic glory might have sounded live with Jim at the helm. Riders on the Storm was released as the second single from L.A. Woman. That was on uh, June 1971. It followed Lover Madly, which uh, that came out in March. It would be the last single released by The Doors while Jim Morrison was still alive. Riders reached number 14 on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100. It went to number 12 on the U.S. Cashbox Top 100 Singles Chart. And it went to number 11 on the U.S. Billboard Easy Listening Chart. You can imagine that. Internationally, it was uh, number 22 in the U.K., I believe. Went to number 5 in Canada. And perhaps fittingly, to number 1 in France. L.A. Woman actually certified multi-platinum, selling 2 million copies on June 10, 1987, the album. In 1983, Annabelle Lamb had a UK Top 30 hit with a cover of Riders. Into this world with rum. The summer of uh, 1999, at Woodstock, guitarist Robert Krieger played Riders with Creed. Riders on the storm. In 2010, Santana did a cover version featuring Chester Bennington and Ray Manzarek. In 2015, Simple Minds covered it live during the Big Music UK tour. Riders on the Storm has been featured in a lot of stuff. Uh, Wonder Years, uh, Basketball Diaries, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Fringe, Family Guy, Teen Wolf, that was in 2016. I'm sure there's much more. Orson biographer Danny Sugarman once said that Jim was obsessed with discovery, finding meaning, understanding why we are and where we're going. He searched compulsively for the pulse of the world. I also like how Ray Manzarek put it. Jim existed to take us all on a psychic voyage. He was our roadman, he was our shaman, he was our madman and our sensitive poet. The life and psyche of Jim Morrison was an ever-churning uh, maelstrom of brilliance and madness. At his best, Jim was an introspective poet in pursuit of meaning. But on other days, he flirted with destruction or outright seduced it. He was known to push people to the edge and when possible, kick them over it. Uh, maybe his purpose was to simply shake up the status quo, or maybe he had his own killer on the road in the highway of his mind to contend with. I don't know. Still, when he sings, Girl, You Gotta Love Your Man, it feels like a, a call for redemption. Girl, you gotta love your man. Now, from what I've read, I think that 
Jim wanted to let go of the mayhem inside of him, if not completely, at least some of it. But he couldn't do it on his own. He needed someone that he trusted to help him overcome. From this perspective, uh, maybe Riders on the Storm can be seen as a, a petition to become a, a better man or a better person. The world on you depends, our life will never end. Maybe, who's to say? I'm sure Jim would never tell us if it was. Regardless though, for those of us who have discovered Jim's incomparable lyrical intellect, his poetry and his haunting interpretation of song, we can be grateful that this uh, uncommon vagabond has given us a roadmap to follow. You know, as the miles stretch before us on our own lonely highways, we can draw on his insight and find our way amongst the riders on the storm, I suppose. Leave us a comment about The Doors and Jim Morrison's supernatural swan song. What are your memories of this amazing piece of music? Let us know in the comments below. And if you enjoy this content, make sure to subscribe below so we, you never miss out on our daily videos. Hit the, the bell so you never miss out. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Make sure to check us out on Patreon. Until next time, three chords and the truth.